Good morning, everyone. I'm Karthik Guja. I welcome you for the uh, monthly endovascular life case webcast uh, from Mount Sinai, New York. Uh, before we go to the lab with Dr. Krishnan's team, uh, just a few reminders. Um, we, because we have our uh, big symposium coming in next, uh, next month. For that, any uh, previous live case uh, can be viewed on peripheralinterventions.org. You can, go, you can, you can uh, go online and look at the uh, previous uh, registered um, uh, webcasts on the archive cases. And uh, the next live case, uh, as a reminder, would go on June 28th. Uh, before that, uh, if anybody is interested, uh, we would love to uh, um, see you here at uh, New York for our um, yearly annual webcast. Uh, um, live webcast with symposium, um, endovascular complex uh, coronary vascular and structural symposium, which starts on June 13th to 16th. Uh, you guys can go and register at ccssymposium.org. Uh, this year, we are proud to be uh, collaborating with uh, Link uh, for the complex uh, endovascular symposium, which is a two-day symposium. We'll have live cases from New York in Mount Sinai, as well as from reputed uh, institutions all over the world. So before, uh, without any further delay, we'll go to the lab with Dr. Krishnan's team. Good morning, Dr. Krishnan. Good morning, Karthik, and um, I want to welcome everyone, including yourself. Um, you know, we've got a, a really phenomenal, difficult case here that been, we, Vishal and myself have been working on for two days. Um, you know, this is a guy uh, who, really a case we have not done here in, the, in, in, our, in our live broadcast, just because of the logistics of doing this case. Um, but before that, I just wanted to give a little interlude like, and, and follow up what you were saying with the symposium. Uh, Torka, please. Uh, the, the symposium, you know, it, it's really a phenomenal opportunity because for the first time, uh, you know, we're, we're collaborating with uh, an incredibly well-established and, and really, uh, uh, you know, one of the leaders in, in education of endovascular techniques uh, in LINK. You know, uh, and uh, Dirk Scheinert and his team have really uh, been uh, been phenomenal in, uh, in, uh, in in setting this up with us and helping us die please and helping us to really f uh, do this symposium, make it very very relevant to everybody here in, in the Americas uh, to be able to you know do these these kind of difficult cases. Can you bring this uh, monitor somewhere near me, please? Uh, so so you know as you know, Karthik, the uh, um, our our uh, setup is with live cases both from Germany as well as from America. And, um, and you know that uh, the beauty here is, is, that, is, that, is that the live cases are going to be transmitted and really are going to be relevant live cases with, with relevant discussion based on what are some of the, uh, you know, the controversies, difficulties that we all face in doing these kind of cases. So um, our friends at Link, like us, have done uh, thousands of these cases. Give me a little die. And, and um, you know, are, are going to be transmitting exemplary live cases to, to to create these discussions. So um, I, I welcome all of you to that. More importantly, you know, this time Vishal and yourself are leading the fellows course. Um, and the fellows course, you know, we already have uh, lots of fellows who are enrolled in this course. Uh, and, uh, and I think the fellows course is going to be really phenomenal in that it's going to, it's going to be, show me down, is going to allow us to educate the, the up and coming, you know, uh, future of, uh, of our field. So, so that part of it we're very excited about. And we have a cadaver lab this year. Right? Yes, we've had a cadaver lab last <laughs> year. This year. year. Again, we've, we're going to have a cadaver lab and obviously a lot of case-based discussion with a world-class world faculty as, as we always are able to attract, which is really a testament to, uh, to everything that we've, we've accomplished here. But, uh, you know, that's just enough about the symposium. But without further ado, like I said, uh, Vishal, Vishal has spent a sleepless light nest last night with this patient. And now we're going to go ahead and, uh, and turn it over to uh, Farhan Majid. But before that, let me um, introduce our team. We've got uh, uh, Ray Lascano here, uh, who's our interventional nurse practitioner. We've got, uh, obviously, Dr. Kapoor, who needs no introduction. We've got our interventional fellow. We've got uh, uh, Elizabeth. And we've got uh, Cristobal, our tech. So again, uh, Farhan, right to you. OK. Can I get the uh, slides, please? Thank you. Um, so this is a very interesting case. So this is a. 65-year-old male with a history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Uh, the patient has a previous history of peripheral arterial disease and has, has had a right SFA uh, intervention with uh, drug-coated balloons as well as stenting, including a Supera and Zilver stent. 
Um, the right uh, peronia was also intervened upon with PTA, and this was just done in February of 2017. Uh, previous to that, he's had left uh, popliteal stenting and left peroneal That's stenting. Good. So now Just the patient, uh, since February, uh, was doing well, Sorry. and now he comes back in with severe right lower extremity rest pain, uh, Rutherford grade two, category four, Fontaine stage three, over the last two weeks. Uh, his symptoms have been progressive, and uh, he is not noted to have any ischemic ulcers noted. Next slide. So as we can see, his past medical history is hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He's got chronic renal insufficiency with a creatinine of 1.8. Uh, and again, uh, peripheral arterial disease. Just of note, uh, uh, previous uh, popliteal uh, stent, but more, more interestingly, the right SFA was just stented on February 8th, and at that time, the patient received a um, drug-coated balloon therapy as well as Supera, a 5.5 by 60 millimeter stent in the mid-SFA, and a Zilver 60 by 120 millimeter stent in the distal SFA. Next slide. The patient's passed uh, um, as far as medications. Uh, he's on appropriate medications, including aspirin, Plavix, uh, Lipitor, and Coprolol. He's a previous longtime smoker and quit 10 years ago and otherwise negative. Next slide. Uh, on examination uh, of note, uh, on extremity exams, he's got uh, Dopplerable pulses at this point in the right DP and PT. Uh, left uh, DP and PT are normal. Uh, the patient's laboratory data reveals that his creatinine is 1.8. Uh, and on his ABIs, you can see his right ABI is 0 0.4. Uh, the vascular ultrasound that he had now shows that the right SFA is 100% occluded again. Next slide. So um, I just put up the completion angiogram from oh, feb excellent. February. Uh, you should have put up the pre, too. Um, yes, yeah, uh, well, I didn't have the pre. So this is the completion angiogram, um, since uh, this is kind of uh, what we're talking about. You can see that uh, he did receive a supera stent and a zilver stent in the mid and distal uh, SFA. So you can see that the proximal SFA there has mild disease. There's a stent in the mid segment, and you can see there's good flow uh, through the SFA. Next line. Distally here, uh, you can see that the Zilver uh, stent is also widely patent on completion angiogram uh, with good flow into the popliteal. Uh, and uh, then you can see that, uh, uh, that uh, the TP trunk has mild disease. Next slide. So here you can see the TP trunk has some mild to moderate disease with an occluded AT and an occluded PT and then good flow in the perineal. Next slide. And here at the level of the foot, you can see the perineal filling, uh, and there is reconstitution of the AT in this segment. Next, next slide. So at this point, uh, um, since, uh, since February, uh, now the patient is brought back for his new symptoms, and we did a peripheral angiogram at this point. So next slide. So you can see here the aorta and the iliac system are without uh, significant disease. Next slide. So this is just a runoff, and I have DSA images after this. Uh, so you can see that the osteal SFA is now completely occluded. Uh, there is occlusion of the proximal, mid, and uh, distal SFA. Um, and then there's reconstitution at the level of, uh, just past the silver stent at the level of the popliteal. Next slide. So here you can see the occlusion in the proximal uh, to mid SFA. Next slide. Again there's, uh, again, there's occlusion in the mid to distal segment. Next slide. And here at the level of the popliteal, you can see just past the stent, uh, there's flow back at the level of the, at the P2 segment of the popliteal. Uh, just below that, you can see um, uh, the AT is occluded and the peroneal fills. Next slide. So here, there's flow uh, in the peroneal. The AT and PT are occluded. Next slide. And here at the level of the foot, you can see that there is uh, filling, a reconstitution of the AT and good filling of the peroneal. So just in uh, summary, uh, this is a 65-year-old with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, who's had, a, who's had uh, stenting uh, of the SFA and now presents with a significant rest pain in the right lower extremity with uh, ABI of 0 0.4. And you can see the peripheral angiogram showed a right SFA occlusion with reconstitution at the level of the popliteal below the stent. 
Um, so the plan was, uh, and Dr. Christian is going to go over the next uh, few angiograms, uh, the plan at this point was to uh, perform SFA intervention okay. and, uh, with thrombolysis Great. and so on. So the one thing that uh, he did not show you was um, the, the pre-angiogram. So I'm going to step outside, and I want you guys to um, come with me outside over there. Okay. PK, so, uh, before we, before we yeah. just move on, I have a, a curious question. Why did, we, why did we take an angiogram from the right side? Why did we get because, access on the right? Because we were fixing, we were, at that time, we were fixing the left SFA. Uh, because uh, the, patient, the patient had not become, uh, was not having rest pain at the time. He was complaining of vague symptoms of his leg that had just initially started. Okay. So, uh, hold on a second. Uh, so, yeah. I'm going to pull up the current yeah, angiogram. Um, and, um, hold on. Will you have an MRN? Yeah, with the one. Uh, okay. Um, so so, uh, so so let me um, yeah. let me uh, so I think I think the important point here is 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 how did that angiogram look how did the vessel look and what were the options at that time um, and so so let me let me give you a little bit of uh, background so so when, when when you see the angiogram uh, it's obviously something that's not a good uh, uh, endovascular case and really not a good surgical case at that time Can we get this uh, the, uh, the 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 patient was a uh, had um, had a, a yeah. claudication obviously, and and so at that at that situation, our vascular surgery team was not interested at the you know or felt that uh, that a that a okay, bypass one, is is uh, is is an indicated uh, uh, thing here. So so I want to show you what that what that leg looks like. I'm going to change it to you. Let me just anonymize it. Yeah. So at that stage, so okay, the um, one, the picture the of the lower extremity. Okay, <coughs> zoom in over there. Shows you a, a severely diffusely diseased proximal SFA with, with an occlusion at the level of the mid-segment right here. Right. With no reconstitution really until yeah. about, right about there. Yeah, severely time. diseased above knee popliteal, severely mm -hmm. diseased popliteal, severely diseased, uh, uh, you know, P2, P3 segments. And then uh, you can see here with really just the same perineal runoff. Right. So, so we did not, you know, when you compare this, and I'm going to play it again one more time so all of you can see it, and then I'm going to go ahead and show you our final result. You know, we, we thought we had a fantastic final result. We had done, we had done drug-coated angioplasty, the proximal. We were forced to stent the, uh, the distal because of dissection um, and the popliteal because of dissection. So we used a Zilber and a, and a Supera. And we felt that we had given this patient the probably the best therapy possible with drug coated as well as uh, with Zilver and Supera in, in order to show. So you can see it's a really a, a horrible disease. The really only bypass target was the perineal, distal in, infopop, right. Right. and uh, and he has no good vein by the way because he has right. venous insufficiency. We should have talked about that. So 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 he really doesn't have any good vein here to bypass, and he's been ablated. And he was a claudicant also. So right? so, so yeah, yeah, he's a claudicant he's at a this claudicant, time when so we're doing this. Yeah. So I want to show you the final picture. <coughs> So the final picture here, let me show you. I don't know. I hope I have one final here. That's probably the foot. Yeah, that's the foot. So here we go. So here's the distal, here's the SFA into the pop. <coughs> you can see the supera there, well deployed. Well deployed. No, no expansion, good runoff, no dissection in the level of the perineal. And then you can see here the, uh, the proximal silver looking really good. And the proximal SFA with some minor dissection at this spot, but honestly nothing that Vishal and I felt would, would, uh, would create him from thrombosing. <coughs> especially with this kind of flow. Yeah. So now, when he comes back to us, uh, and this is a little complicated, and I think that's why I'm taking some time for our audience to be able to understand this, uh, is, is, okay, how do we approach this, this patient? So now, so, so now go, go to the next slide here, please. So we, we decided to do a staged thrombolysis of this patient, which, because Vishal and I really felt strongly that this was a, 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 a thrombus issue. And you can see here, uh, when we're up and over on Monday, we basically took a picture to show the ostium of the SFA is occluded with good flow of the profunda. Next, please. So we had to form the loop technique. So that doesn't mean necessarily that it's a, it's a atherosclerotic lesion, but I think that we had a, a thrombotic lesion that had organized over the, the period between somewhere in, in, May, in um, April, May, to where we are today. Right. So, so we, we, we do the loop technique. Second thing we did was we wanted to grab the loop and also enter the stent properly. So that's part of the reason we did. Next, please. PK, just a question before you go in. When the wire went in, 
with the catheter? Did it go very smoothly or? No, well, I mean, I think Vishal and I had to make some, make some a little bit of turning. We were very cognizant and we've done this live multiple times to show everybody, all of us have, in terms of how to do it. And you can see in the distal here, how the wire is going all different angles. Right. So we were very, very careful because we knew that was, this here was going very smooth, but it was all thrombus and clot. So at this stage, we didn't know whether we were dissecting or not. Next, please. So we switched out to an 014 to, to get into the stent, and then we went ahead, formed the loop within the stent, and now it's all smooth. Next. So then we took our distal runoff, which showed that we still had the patent perineal, and I think this is important for the audience always to know what your runoff status is prior to you doing anything. Next. Then, uh, then uh, Vishal and I went ahead and put our, um, our Unifuse catheter. Mm -hmm. uh, he picked a 300 centimeter catheter and we, we, we went ahead and dripped uh, TPA without a bolus at, uh, at one microgram, uh, uh, one, one milligram per hour, right? One milligram per hour for, for t 24 hours. And the important thing, I'm gonna have Vishal comment on the importance of doing the check angios and, and what are the things you need to do at that stage, Vishal. Once the patient goes into the, the unit or whatever the recovery area is, what, are the, what is the stuff that you want them to follow? Well, I guess the biggest issue with TPA catheter is because it's a lysis catheter, you have to be cognizant that there's a lot of bleeding issues that might come up with. So we always want to make sure if we are planning, like in this case, we had an idea about thrombus to get, first the access should be a good access because most of the times you'll end up with having a, hem if it's a repeat stick, if it's a posterior wall stick, you might end up having some hematoma, especially higher chances in this case. So that was the first concern we had was to get a good initial access stick. And then once we have the TPA catheter in, of course, we run the heparin on the sideboard, which is 1,000 units an hour uh, because of cognizant TPA. But we mainly look for h &H, which we do every Q4 hourly. We, we look for fibrinogen level and track it, actually. If the fibrinogen level falls less than 150, we stop the TPA because it's a sign that it's overacting, so we need to scale back on the TPA. Of course, we do neuro checks. Which, uh, we do localized limb examinations to make sure there's no pain. Uh, follow up with the patients. And the other important thing is to make sure the blood pressure is well controlled. If your patient is hypertensive, we empirically put them on, on some anti-hypertensive drip, whether it be nitro, esmolol, or whatever you like, so that their blood pressure is well maintained and the chances of having hypertensive bleed anywhere else in the body is very, very mm -hmm. low. So I guess following them routinely and then bringing them back in 24 hours to reevaluate is the... Uh, Vishal, do you check step. the CPK levels and... Uh, yeah, you do. I mean, especially not routinely, the unless the patient really starts to have symptoms. It's not, we mainly do the h and &H and the fibrinogen levels, and of course the PTPTT to make sure the heparin is not super high or super low. But uh, CPK is routinely, we, I, I don't check it personally, unless the patient starts having symptoms, then you're concerned of uh, rhabdo or compartment syndrome and all the stuff. And then you want to confirm your diagnosis by physical exam and getting the CPK involved as well. Those are excellent points, and I think you know those of you at home who are watching and who are not doing a lot of analytics, you got to be very, very careful with, with these things that Vishal uh, just went over so beautifully. The second thing I want you to talk about is, uh, Vishal, is a little bit of the development of compartment sometimes with reperfusion. You yeah. know, and I, you know right. that's not a rare thing, and that's why these patients, like you said, need to be right. checked every couple of hours or every hour, even in the beginning right. stages. So, so you know, uh, can you talk a little bit about the compartment and, and why it may occur? Well, again, compartment syndrome is because of uh, excessive uh, TPA and drop in fibrinogen levels. So the, uh, the lytic component really causes uh, reperfusion, the reperfusion injury. injury, leading to damage of the local muscle, rhabdo, elevated right. CPK, uh, pain. And then eventually, if you don't catch it early in time, it could lead to neurological uh, disasters right. and end up in severe complications. And patient might end up with fasciotomy and all those things which exactly. you don't want to throw. So. so so a couple of things about that which is important is obviously you know it's gonna be a reperfusion type injury unless you perforate it going down. Right. And and the second thing is you wanna make sure that you, you recognize the signs of early compartment. You know, the earliest sign of compartment, which is very important to remember, is a loss of sensation between the first and second digit in the thena, in the, uh, is it thena, or is it, uh, what is yeah. it, what is it, the legus thena, yeah? Plantar aspirin. Yeah, plantar, we have plantar, plantar yeah. surface the between, between uh, the, the space between the first and second uh, ray. So in interdigital space, yeah, that's probably the best thing. Christina is hand, right? Right. See, I forgot my basic anatomy. So, so, so second, second is second is also you. You want to make sure that 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 you you look for you know if that's occurring and you're not certain whether this is still compartment. I mean, the best thing is ask them to step on the gas. You know, it's a it's a loss of dorsiflexion, so or a weakness in dorsiflexion. These are the first two things that you're going to see when, they, when they're starting to get into compartment, you know, after the pain. So I think it's important for you to, you know, keep an eye, educate your, your recovery staff and do this, okay? 
So after we left the, the TPA catheter again, like we talked about, Dr. Kapoor was kind enough to, to bring him back last night. Next slide, please. And, and next slide is just the TPA catheter distal. Next slide. Okay. So now we can go live. So Dr. Kapoor came back last night and, and did a picture, and it's similar to our picture here. And it's, uh, I can even walk you outside and show you the picture. So our, our picture here is, is, the, is the first runoff telling, showing you um, how it looks. So here, I'm just going to show you. I should have just gone. Yeah, I keep going yeah. forward here. Sorry about that. You, had, you, you guys had it all teed up. Yeah. All right. Oops. Okay. And one forward. That's it. And that's it. Okay. So this is the first picture of the SFA. And you can see you have a phenomenal picture. And this is truly how it looks. So you, you see, oh, we did no angioplasty. We did no angiojet. We did nothing. All we did was cross the lesion, leave the TPA catheter for, for 30 hours or whatever it was. Actually, less than 30 because last night the fibrinogenerum 11 dropped. We had to turn off the TPA. Uh, TPA. But we, we saw Dr. Kapoor obviously walked over the, the, the sheet that left the sheet in on a heparin drip, and, and we bought them this morning, and this is our picture. So automatically, the, the, so majority of it, our, our clinical idea that this was thrombus was 100% true. So the thrombus is resolved with the, uh, with the exception of a goob, goober up top, okay? Followed by, you can see mid-distal in the stent. You can see the stent looks pretty good. And again, you can see between the two stents, you have uh, obviously the dissected area that needs to be taken care of. And then, and then the very important, again, to look at your entire runoff, you can see that the runoff is really good. There's just some streaking of thrombus, but really there's really nothing there. And then as you go down distal, you go ahead and you can see here, you have wonderful single vessel runoff, recruitment of the AT, which we didn't see earlier, tremendous collateralization that we didn't see earlier. And then when you go into the foot, you can see the recruitment of the dorsalis pedis very robustly. And then you can see the posterior tibial light up, as well as obviously the very dominant perineal uh, that, that, was, that was there beginning. So now we're at the stage after 25 minutes of explaining what we did, but, but it's important. Uh, Dr. Kapoor, can you, uh, can you talk a little bit about the dose of TPA? Uh, uh, well, we talked about the right. dose, but, but if we were going to do power pulse, you know, what, what, what would be the indication here for you to do power pulse versus leave a drip? Well, I guess it's, for me, the biggest uh, thing to look at is what's our thrombus burden. Mm -hmm. Usually if in cases like these, when the whole SFA is occluded, you know, and the chronicity of the thrombus as well. We know in last time when we took a picture, it's almost a month ago, that there was already some developing thrombus right there. So I guess the chronicity of the thrombus and the extent of thrombus is what drives it. If you think there's a lot of thrombus, then the angiojet, you might do power pulse TPA with 2 to 5 milligrams and do it over 20 minutes by using the angiojet. But I think the results are not that satisfactory. And there's a higher chance of distal embolization with it because of the thrombus burden. So in this case, keeping in mind the extent of the thrombus, the lytic catheters work better because you give them over a period of 24 hours to do their job, which we expect them to do in 20 minutes. If it's a focal thrombus in a stent and it's more acute and you think it's a soft thrombus which will dissolve faster with TPA, then in that case we do a quick power pulse uh, 20 minute injection, 2 to 5 milligrams, and then go for a coffee break, come back in 20 minutes and then take pictures and see how it is. Most of the time it clears up. Like you can see here in proximal SFA, there is still, still residual thrombus, layered thrombus thing, which shows us that it's been going on for a longer period of time. So in this case, TPA infusion is a better treatment option for better results than doing a local power pulse. So we shall oh, so, pl mm -hmm. pla placing a filter, placing Rub. a filter or no would decide, uh, it, would, would that change your decision to leave a TPA catheter no. versus a power pulse? No, not really. I'm, I mean, it's just in these cases, just better to put a filter down, especially with the poor runoff. You don't want to have poor distal, uh, distal embolization, and then you are tracing it all the way down to the tibials and creating more problem for the patient right. than helping him. So I'm always aggressive enough to use filters irrespective of uh, if it's a smaller thrombus or a, long, uh, or a bigger thrombus. So, so go, see, okay. uh, go to the first picture. So I think I have a question for the two of you. So when would you, other than what you talked about thrombus burden, if you had an occluded vessel, right, like this one was, how do you decide whether you want to do power pulse or not? So, so you say in this case, what in this case would tell you not to do a power pulse? So, um, PK, for me, power pulse, do, doing a power pulse or not depends upon can I use a filter or not. Okay. Uh, in this case, um, well, initially when the patient came in, mm -hmm. um, I think you know, if, if, it was, if it was not involving the popliteal, if it was just, and the patient was having symptoms, and it was just a that. SFA, I would have done a power pulse instead of leaving a TPA catheter. But here, we don't have any la landing zone for the filter. It's a long segment. I think the length of the lesion. Also, I think, you know, uh, leaving a TPA, especially with the popliteal stent, 
I think I I think TPA catheter is better. Well, well, you know, I think I think you're getting to the same thing, which is uh, what Vishal was saying is a burden of uh, thrombus, but I, I, and a landing zone for the filter. But I, you guys got to uh, the way I look at it with with what what I've done with experience is that you have to understand that there's no way to predict the burden of thrombus. Right. So so it's not like the coronary. You know, when you see, you know, it, it's a different pathology. Let's not even worry about the coronary here. So what I look at it and learn from is how the wire behaves. So so if the wire goes smooth from the top to the bottom. Okay, whoop, like a 035 uh, J wire goes right all the way down to the mm -hmm. pop, you know that's a huge burden of thrombus. Second, if, if, the wire, if the wire breaks the proximal cap, we have difficulty breaking the cap, flies for a distance, and then has difficulty going all the way down distal, okay, uh, and you have no idea about the chronicity of the situation. Like in this case, we knew, okay, you had probably within the last four to six, four weeks, this, this is occluded. If you had no idea, say you were just doing an occluded SFA, then in my opinion, I assume at that stage that, that there's a, either a atherosclerotic plaque up top or an arsterosis up top, followed by a, 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 a patent area in the middle that's hibernating, filled with clot or debris, and then an, another area that's, that's occluded distally because of the difficulty. In this case, we had difficulty up top. We had very easy part through the middle, through both the stents, and difficulty in the, between each one of the stents. So to me, I looked at it this way. If you have two 150 millimeter stents full, or whatever, 100 millimeter stents full of thrombus, and you have difficulty up top, the chances of a thrombus burden being high with a single vessel runoff are huge. So to summarize, if you have a short segment of, of, of wire passage that's easy, with two, two large segments with, with, with difficulty, then I would do power pulse, as long as I could use a filter. So, so to me, power pulse, it just, it's, it's a judgment call. You know, other thing, is, other thing to think about is to reduce your time of TPA. You could do power pulse first, even in a large clot burden like this, if you can use filter. Wait 20 minutes, like Vishal said, have a coffee, come back, take a picture, say, oh my God, okay, I cleared a lot, but residually, there's still a ton of clot. Let me put a TPA catheter in now at 0.5 microgram per, 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 per hour, a milligram per hour, and then send him to the CCU for eight hours or 12 hours, and then bring him back at 12 hours rather than 20 hours. So there's a lot of different logic in, in the way you use it, uh, <coughs> and a lot of it is your experience. But I think here the more important thing is the mechanism of failure. Why did this guy fail? One, is it runoff? Well, could be. Two, is it, is it a dissection and, and flow limitation? Could be. Three, is it acute thrombosis of drug-coated technology? I mean, that's something we've never talked about. We have the R classification in coronaries. We don't have a classification in peripherals. We talk about, you know, no, we're starting to notice in our practice, at least I know, I know myself and, uh, and Farhan and Vishal have spoken about this, we're starting to see some DCBs thrombos a little bit later than expected, especially with poor vessel runoff. That hasn't really sh uh, shown through in, 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 the, in the DCB IDE trials. However, if you look at the DCB IDE trials, the complexity of patient enrolled was nowhere near this. So, so therefore, the real world data, which is really TLR rates out to one year, we don't know. So, so there has been no reports of these things. And I think one of the things that I implore everybody to do is start looking at their data, trying to see whether you're having a higher incidence of that. And I know that we've started to look at all our real world lesions with zero and one vessel runoff um, with diffuse lesions like this to see our thrombosis rates. Because maybe there is a reason now to go to a longer period of anticoagulation or, or maybe a newer antiplatelet agent. Or maybe even uh, antithrombotic therapy with possibly a Xeralto or not. The answer is we don't know. We do know that dealing with this is very difficult. Because now, if I trash his, his perineal, then Vishal and I are stuck here. We've already given lysis. We, we haven't. Two, there's really no bypass options, although now he, he, he was rest pain. Now he's converted back to no rest pain and likely claudication. So that th these are important points. But for the technical aspect, to keep up with time, play the last film, Vishal. When you look at this, uh, the first shot, I mean, I'm so sorry. When you look at this picture, you immediately see the first picture that Vishal is going to show you. You see that you have clot, minus. Right. You see right. you have immediate thrombus up top. And you yeah. can see it right there as the goober. Especially in the proximal. That can yep. either be dissection or layered thrombus. So automatically, we're going to angiojet. We have a Abbott Ember Shield. We didn't want to IVIS here for unnecessary uh, manipulation without angiogenesis, so we're going to start. So we're not power pulsing. We're just doing very, very slow angiojet here. So you're not giving any further TPA or anything? Like no that. further TPA, hopefully. 
And, you know, remember when you anti jet technique is we go about 30 seconds. And I'm just going to go very, very slowly here. Because this was the area likely of that thrombus and or dissection. So I have a question here. Say, l l let me be a real world guy here. Everything goes great because we're the best, right, at Sinai? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. So everything goes, everything goes great. And, and now all of a sudden, you've got a clean artery, minimal embolization into your filter, go. And now the question is, how do you treat? And you do an IVIS. IVIS shows dissections uh, with minimal, you know, layering, quote unquote, thrombus. I don't think IVIS is very good at thrombus, although Volcano would argue. Um, and, and, uh, and now uh, my question is, what, what's your treatment of choice? So you opened a can of worms because you said uh, the third option possibly would be uh, DCB. Uh, well, we already uh, did occlusion, DCB. Right? No, I'm saying you're, you're talking about DCB occlusion, right? You're talking about restenosis from DCB, acute thrombosis from DCB. So now you can't do DCB because that's a possibility on him, right? So the, I think the only other option left is either to balloon him, watch him closely, or uh, stent the whole segment. Uh, based on how it looks, because he has some eccentric calcification here and there. He Let's has some multiple dissection planes, right? So my understanding is uh, everybody is running through uh, stenting the whole segment of SFA, right? Off. You have any other options, Vishal? No, I think I, I, I guess it eventually, like PK said to begin with, it's all the what's the uh, what's the origin or what's the cause of uh, having all this thrombus. <laughs> Is it a dissection? It's less likely a neoatherosclerotic lesion or a fibrotic stuff, Start. or is it just poor vessel runoff? So in this case, we use DCB. It didn't really work, so I'll probably not go in for a DCB again. I would probably, if it comes down to, most likely is stented. Uh, the question might be whether using another drug, a regular bare metal stent, a drug-coated stent, or using a wire bar. Now, keeping on the outflow format usually in this case especially it's like one one and a half vessel outflow i would probably shy away from using a wire bond uh, but probably end up stenting using a, a drug coated stent so uh, i don't know what's your thought on that <coughs> so i would not use a wire bond on, on this vishal because right. of the one vessel runoff of exactly. course clearly um, you can use supera um, it's fine i think looks like the stents are are not restenosing i think right. the issue is not his stents the issue is his native vessel so it looks like uh, wherever PK is moving this, uh, um, the angiojet, okay. within the stents, it, it seems to be moving very well. I mm -hmm. think the edge of the break. stents and in the native vessel is where I see the deflection of the catheter. Okay. Um, yeah. And I think when you guys were wiring, if I'm not wrong, correct me, uh, PK and Vishal, like you had difficulty with the native vessel more Correct. than the stents itself, right? I understand, yeah. So it looks like that's where your, most of the recoil happened. Um, the recoil or <coughs> acute uh, thrombosis could be because of the Walk DCB or yeah. oh, the vessel itself. So, so I, I mean, I think all those are good points, and I think the real answer is we don't really know. <laughs> so I, I think that what we should do here is we do angiojet, we do IVIS, and then decide. One argument could be is this is all clot. You know, the vessel without angioplasty looked pretty damn good, right? Uh, you know, so, why, so if you wanted to do bare metal stenting, with just, um, like, say, a protege Everflex or, or, or an Abbott, uh, you know, whatever stent, whatever stent you like, it doesn't really matter, uh, which is fine, right? So, so that's something you could do. The, the, the other thing you could do is just leave it alone. Balloon angioplasty with a regular balloon and then, and then put him on, uh, on Berlinta Ofna. Put him on Berlinta and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Zeralto. Get some velocities uh, at the end of today and then decide. I, I think the wrong thing to do is a Viabon. I don't think we have any data at this stage, especially with thrombus, to say we want to use a Viabon. I don't think that we can say with, with any certainty that, that a further drug-coated therapy is going to be useful. Matter of fact, I, I have a worry that this may be detrimental. Uh, the only thing is if you feel that scaffolding was the, uh, sorry, scaffolding was the issue, and, and the patient had thrombus because of recoil, then, then, I, then you know, maybe a silver PTX or, or, or just a regular uh, protege Everflex or the other one. So, you know, it's a very complex decision process at this stage. I think the, the key here is you don't want to make him worse, right? So you've, you've cleared the thrombus. You've done a great job of that. You've, you've gotten through the vessel. You've protected the distal. You did further angiojet to pull out any residual thrombus that you have. Now you need to do a, a picture and an intravascular ultrasound, IVUS, to really see 
what's going on. So PK, now, what, what would I was add, add here? Well, you know, like, like say you have a flap that's moving back and forth and, and who knows whether that flap dropped down, closed the vessel and caused the whole thing to, to thrombose. I don't know. Right now I have a wire across it. It, it, didn't, it didn't close, but with the dynamic movements of the SFA, when the patient is walking, who knows what's happening? Right. So, so I, think, I think an intravascular ultrasound would really help us a lot and I think this is the kind of case where even in the periphery, like we do in the coronaries, using an intravascular ultrasound will help. Okay. So I, I think this is one of those where there's really no right answer. We do know that we've checked all the boxes. We've thought about all the things that you need to think about before doing this. So now here, what I'm going to do is the opposite. I'm going to start with my filter and come back up to see whether we've got crud in our filter. So oh, just want. to understand what Vishal and, and I have done. We're on DSA? Oh, you want the, for okay. filter, you want this? Yeah, we are. So you can see we embolized everything into our filter. So I want all, all of you to see this, you know? So this is why this is so difficult to treat. Get the penumbra ready? This is why this is so difficult to treat and why all of us have to think about it. Let's see whether we embolize this one into the, into the filter. The proximal SFA, right? Yeah, let's see. That's what we were thinking. And it's gone. Oh, it's there. I think there. less, though. Yeah. So clearly now we need to <laughs> suction out the filter, and this is going to be a good situation. So again, part of this is preparation, right? This is why you don't do these cases without having the tools that you need. So before I even do the IVIS, I'm going to, I'm going to aspirate this filter. PK, if you leave, uh, just to be a devil's advocate, you know, I know we don't do Biloni, uh, Biloni vessels for just Claudicans, or, um, but he's a rest pain guy, critical right. limb. But... So if you leave the if you leave or you stand this vessel for either any uh, we go any option corner would you improve the baloney vessel flow? Would I think you, you have to, and I right? think I think the Europeans are ahead of us in this. In that they obviously I think it's logic would state that SFA patency is dependent on its outflow because it's right. a tube. Uh, general, what's going on? Is everything okay? Yeah. Okay. So what I'm saying is that I think that you know in this case probably opening up uh, that perineal definitely today is going to matter to me. Okay. Let me see that distal wire. Mm -hmm. It's going to so matter to me. opening the peroneal, of course, I mean, peroneal is a one-vessel runoff, right? That's what gives the collateral. Do you think he has, he has a very good anterior tibial reconstitution? Do you think uh, I, opening I the anterior tibial? No, I don't know if I would open the anterior tibial at this stage. Ready, guys? No, not this stage. I'm yes. saying bring right, it back yeah. after Turn a month or so and do it. Okay. I'm saying would you bring him back and after a month and do it or... Possibly, turn it off. So, so one of the things with the penumbra, which is a great device I want you guys to watch, is that there's a lot of suction of blood, all right? So what you want to do here is be very focal. This is not a hold, uh, you can show the setup of the device guys for him. You can see it basically is a canister. It's basically a neuro uh, device that's used for clout retrieval from the brain that we're now adapting. Actually, probably we do, we do the most of this in the country. Uh, I would argue we definitely do one of the most. And, and, and I can tell you that we use a ton of it what we generally do is we, we use it with a multi-purpose catheter as well as with a regular penumbra catheter. Penumbra comes with a six French catheter with a good lumen, but we found that sometimes that catheter is, doesn't have the, the strength to push through a very diseased SFA like this one. So here we just transferred it over to the multi-purpose attached it, which helps us to treat the patient. So, so what we're doing is we're gonna go down with this multi-purpose catheter or penumbra catheter, and, and what we're gonna do is, is, is suction the clot. The key of doing this is not, I don't think it's so much the SFA, it's the distal. And I think that's the part that we have to understand here because the distal is gonna be very important. I'm gonna show you a couple of techniques. I just wanna suck the proximal SFA here, turn it back on while we go through. So PK, when you're doing huh? this, just like any other device, you always look for a blood flow? Well, you're always looking for blood flow, but also I think, I think what you're really looking for is, is, is the flow within because if you get a clot stuck in it, then what's gonna happen you're actually going to see it. You've got to be very careful in the stent not to get caught. Stop. So I'm going to stop here because I know the stents are clean. And I'm going to take it down across this. Only question sometimes is you don't have length with this catheter. And we might have to switch out to the penumbra catheter. How long is that six French penumbra catheter, guys? I think multipurpose should be enough, right? It's yeah, uh, sure. I don't know. He's a pretty tall gentleman. Off. It's a 135, so. No, you're off here. Okay, now, now it's important. What's your feed, Michelle? Yes, go ahead. Now it's important to manipulate through the stent 
especially the open cell stand here. Show me to keep it off. It is off. Okay, keep it off. Keep it off. Mm -mm. So as you can see, the open cell stand is creating issues for me, but I'll torque it away. But using a multipurpose catheter, you can torque it, right? That's the advantage That's you the have. That's the whole idea, yeah. Turn it on now, guys. That's a, okay, good. Yeah, That's a great technique. Sorry, sir. Good. Excellent. So now, you've you got to be careful because the filter will get trapped. <clears throat> so right. I don't want to get too close to the filter. So but your flow seems to be great. Good. So I'm going to go well. ahead and see this. And then now I'm going to turn off the penumbra and I'm going to ask for um, a, a, a dye for me to inject. Oh, yeah. uh. Would you go a little bit lower or just... No, just you know, I don't want to necessarily capture the filter here. Right. If I wanted to capture the filter, we'll, we'll capture it on the penumbra. But this is going to tell me what we're dealing with. Uh, it's an ODSA. That's it's not great. bad. We cleaned it up pretty good. Yeah. Give it to me again. Turn on the suction. Yeah. Got it. On. This is another advantage you have with the catheter, right? You Got can it. inject it from the catheter. Yeah. Well, you can do that with the penumbra catheter too. I'm just gonna go a little lower, and that's it. I'm done. Okay. Turn it off now. Let's walk it out now. So now Vishal is gonna walk it out, watching the filter, because the key is you don't want to disrupt the filter. Because the filter is still your friend here. Okay, now you saw the flow before. Now we do the penumbra. And these are the kind of steps that I, you know, you got to watch for. You know, this is a case that you're not going to do in your, in your OBL or in your community <laughs> hospital if you don't have these tools. And these aren't expensive tools to get. Everybody can get these tools. The companies are very helpful in putting them in and, and, and helping you to, to uh -huh. perform the proper procedures that you need to. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go DSA here. Okay, watch out. They're stepping on Angie Jet here. Yeah, no. Okay, Sorry. now we're going to go DSA. We saw some smoke there. <laughs> Hold on. We, we, okay. we saw, we saw a little uh, Always also remember to flush the sheath and suck back on the sheath because sometimes you can get some clot on the tip of the, the catheter that you use, which can get trapped and gets, you get caught in your diaphragm, which then will cause you to embolize. <laughs> also, I had to push the sheath in slightly above, so I'm just going to check my position of my sheath to make sure that I'm not in the SFA. I'm lucky here as a cardiologist, I have a pressure tracing, so I know my pressure is good, so I likely am not in the, S in the SFA, but who knows, he's a very tall gentleman. Good, I'm not in the SFA, so I'm happy with that. So now I'm gonna look at my flow here again. Ready? Mm -hmm. So one of the advantages of this, this filter from Abbott is it, it clearly helps us, and still, look at that, a little bit better, a little bit better, okay? I think we're doing pretty good here. Okay, just got some layered thrombus distal, which we'll deal with. <coughs> Not an issue. Not okay, the it. proximal flow was good. Why between these two stents, the distal stents? You, can you take a picture and see? I what's will, happening and I'm there? also going to do an yeah. ibis field. <coughs> because the proximal flow looks fine, right? So, yeah, let's but see here. we are still not getting enough flow. So it might be this area, which is might giving be. you the trouble. I mean, it's just dissected okay. vessel. So, yeah. A lot of layered clot you can see That's there. Yeah. Yep. So we're gonna have to deal with all this in a second. It's gonna get a lot of fun here. So give me a give me an Ivis. <laughs> ACT guys, repeat ACT. <coughs> What's my repeat ACT? You're doing this uh, case on heparin, right? We're doing repeat? it on bivalrudin. Bivalrudin. Okay. There you go. Got it. So his heart rate, everything is stable, Liz. Okay. Okay. Hold on, let me just get over yeah. there. Fine. Okay, I got it. Uh, PK, so uh, what, would the, what would the instructions be? Like somebody is doing this case uh, outside, below. right? After this case is done, Perfect. what do you watch for in a patient, uh, as an outpatient? I mean, I, mean the, you, you, I would definitely, whatever, you, obviously the result you get is going to be important, but, what, you know, get velocities very quickly. I would, I would let him, him, him see him for any thrombosis issues, um, you know, and uh, obviously he was on TPA, so it's not a good time to draw the blood, but I think we would have to draw it at some point. I would prophylactically likely start him on Seralto. Uh, I mean, as long as there's no contraindications for bleeding, okay, off. Okay. Uh, and uh, which there's not, we already gave the TPA. Turn it on, guys. 
I so on. these, are, and then I would do ultrasound. Are you on? Yeah. Okay. Pulling back. So I guess you are pulling from the TP distal peroneal. Distal right peroneal. Oh, no, the distal pop, pop into distal the peroneal. Pop. Oh, sorry. There's the stent. Look at the stent. <coughs> not, not anything. No restenosis, nothing. Right? Good flow. Good flow coming out of the stent now. Maybe not yet. Beautiful flow. My God, the stent is like clean. Well opposed on this side. There's the silver PTX. This uh, uh, right outside the stent. Nope, still there. You go. So a little bit of dissection here, maybe lot, clot. Who knows, right? A lot of plaque burden, though. I don't know if it's clot. I'm not certain. No, but a lot of uh, plaque burden, though. There's a lot of plaque versus clot. clot here, and yeah. you can see the areas <laughs> where it's really dissected. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. This uh, there's a lot of dissection planes yeah, here. A lot of dissection. Multiple dissection. I don't know planes. if our volcano people would feel this is clot or not. <coughs> I don't think it's possible to tell. And as you're coming back into the supera now, yeah. as a supera, supera looks phenomenal, showing you that it's not reached a little bit of layer thrombus on the supera there, but really nothing in the pro in the, in the supera. The stent, the stents look fine. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's all the native vessel that's probably progression of disease, maybe. Mm -hmm. There's or with dissection. <laughs> there you the dissection. There, there you have a lot this of dissection. More of a thrombus. Place. I don't know. <coughs> Look at that complex dissection. Yeah, a lot of dissection, right? Yeah. Or layered thrombus. You're right. It could be all thrombus. Could be the thrombus or dissection. I mean, that, that looks like dissection. I agree with Karthik there. Yeah. That area looks like dissection. Here, it looks like dissection. Yep, there too. Right? Multiple dissection planes. But you can again, see the remember behind the, the vessel, right here, right here. A, that's, that's, that's the flap, flap I was talking yes. about. Yeah, see? that's the biggest. If that's that thing, probably the if haziest that portion you see. one side to the other, right. that's going to be an issue. Let's see if that's in that spot that we thought that's looked kind of funky, too. and it is. Look at that. Yeah, that's where we had That's issues. the spot that looked kind of funky for us. So remember, this is the stuff that you can't tell with the angiogram. That's a great example of what you can't tell. Look at that. How that's nasty. Look at that's that recall. Yeah. I think that's all clot. That's that's clot. I feel that's clot. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what you guys think, but I think that definitely is no, That's definitely is clot. clot, right? Yeah. It's out of the and then, layer. And again, this. again, you got a lot of layered of thrombus here. Yeah. Show me a floral here. And this is getting to that proximal area. So if I was to predict this guy failed because of proximal that's a, that's a, that's a, that's dissection with the flap, that's it, we're out, yeah. with thrombosis. Th that's probably a valid, valid way of saying it, right? Yep. I think that's how we'd fail. So now that we've done this, now I think, I think what we need to do is, I think we, we're forced now to stent <coughs> that proximal. So I think I'm going to go with a bare metal stent uh, from distal to proximal. And I think this is like in the coronaries where we have, in the early days when we had stent thrombosis, we always worried about, or acute demise, we always did bare metal stents. I think we, since we don't have any clarity at this stage, we, we, should, uh, we should stop. We should not use DCB now or a drug-coated stent. I'm going to use a bare metal stent up top. Would you use a supera, Pika? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think, I'm just, I, I think it's an area where I'd like to stand up to the ostium. I think it's an area where we have a, you know, a no flexion points, really, at this area above that proximal. Right. And I think at this stage, I think we'll just go ahead with a regular, uh, uh, regular uh, uh, you know, protege Everflex stent. So let me, let me decide with Vishal and you what length we should use. Remember, there's still a chance he's going to embolize. What would you do with the distal portion, PK? I think I'm going to use another regular stent. I'm not okay. going to use Supera because I don't want the wire to move uh, because I, I want to stay on this filter at this stage. And with the Supera with the herky-jerky motion, right. I think the issue is going to be, will the wire move? So there's our proximal, right? So what do you think, 150, 200? Well, easily. Well, 150. 150 and 200. Yeah, give me a 70, 150. So again, okay, so if you look at the preparation that we, we shall have really uh, uh, mastered here, what we did was we went with a seven French sheet to give us plenty of room to be able to inject over uh, across. We, we have an, a removable Terumo, uh, what is it called, um, uh, TUI, right? Is it called TUI? Yeah, TUI. 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 So this way, if we get clots stuck in, we can bleed it out, which we can't do in the cook sheet. Not that the cook sheet is bad, it's a phenomenal sheet. So, so I think that what we're going to do here is just, uh, you know, I think we've thought everything through. We still may not get away with it, but we've thought everything through here. 
So, you know, I, we, we decided our stent length, and so now I'm going to go AP, and we're going to deploy it. So, uh, Vishal, uh, I'll ask you, you see this patient in the outpatient, right? Uh, that might be a 200 stent PK. So, right. Uh, you think it's 200? No, the length. Oh, we'll, see. We'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Now we'll open a 200. Yeah. So, um, so Vishal, you see him in the clinic, and he has a, he has swelling and everything. Would you tell him, would you give him any instruction? Because he's going to have a lot of swelling. Right. right? He's definitely going to have a lot of swelling. What you want to do is reperfusion edema. That's what you want to prevent. What instructions would you give? Just Careful, for it's around my hand. One second. One second. How would you avoid that? Would you want to tell them use some wraps, stockings, yeah. elevation of legs? Yeah, I think all of those matter. You're right, especially these patients who have chronic total occluded nice SFAs, throat. and when you reperfuse, they have a lot of edema, especially <coughs> in the first 24 and 48 hours. They'll go home, they'll be fine the first day, and next day they'll call you and say, yeah, I have swelling in my leg, what's going on? So I think it's all because of uh, getting the fluid and reperfusion. So what I would do is recommend conservative, purely conservative therapy, including uh, uh, compression stockings, elevation of feet, and of course, if they have a lot of pain, using over-the-counter pain medications, Hello? and then keep pulling up short. with them. So give me a little time from above, and then uh, no, follow, room. follow up with them in uh, in clinic and see how they do. I mean, do we un uh, unmask their underlying yeah, venous insufficiency? Hour. Maybe, but that's another uh, that's another problem for another day. So, it's probably is conservative that? therapy is what we I would recommend. Okay. Just a little short. 200 is too long, and 150 is too short. Mm. So the question is, I don't want to put too much stent inside stent, so I could use a shorter one up top. So let's deploy this here. <coughs> so Vishal is just going to deploy it. Obviously, we don't. We know we're going to be short, so we just. This is perfect. If he doesn't move it, we should be even better. So we're just going to deploy this very carefully. I'm on the floor, bro. Uh, go in a bit first. Oh, pull back, by the way. That's good, right there. So I had uh, uh, PK. I had patients, right patients there. like this who had swelling for like at least two, three months sometimes. Yeah, I agree, brother. So. Be, uh, because okay. of the, especially if you say, if you tell me that he's having chronic venous insufficiency. No, symptoms. that's been fixed though. Okay. I like it. <coughs> Would you take some overlap? If, yeah, because you're just, going to, you, just that you, much. You're going to use some stent anyways. So yeah, we may not. I may leave the ostium alone because there's really we'll revive the ostium, and then decide. See, it actually dropped down because it's a big vessel, which we yeah. expected. So walk it out. It's actually a seven seven it measured. Yeah. But I didn't want to let me show my distal wire here, make sure our filter is not moving. Excellent. Always take these little moments to check everything for yourself and then decide. I'm not gonna post dilate this stent. Right. I'm not because you don't want to same thing. All the same you, you, thing, you know. Yeah, you don't want quite a cheese effect, right? That's right. Yep. Okay, let me see now. Four. Okay, no. Okay, a little diabolic, let's see how short we are. Yeah, so we need another, what, 40 maybe? 40, yeah. yeah. Yep, can somebody, uh, do we have a 40 Abbott stent, uh, Absolute Pro, uh, 7040? If not, you know, somebody has to run down to the OR for me. So we've actually stopped carrying, um, um, you know, bare metal stents other than, you know, what's left over. So we, we don't order bare metals anymore. And I don't know, do we have any protege? Uh, we have eights? We have 8040? Because he's got a big vessel. Yeah. Yeah, give me an 8040. It's got a huge vessel. I think 80 will be fine. Well, because we're measuring 77 by yeah. IVIS. Yeah. So I think in 8040, we should be fine, be fine here. We'll deploy that off. And uh, as always, our crack team here, Karthik, is able to figure it out before you and me. So now, <laughs> now, now, let, now, looks like we'll take a look after this. I still think I'm going to bare metal stent that mid segment, right? You agree with me? Yeah, guys? I think I agree with and you. Then, and then, and then we'll we'll, we'll think about DSing. PK, I'm just curious. That's a flexion point, right? Why would you want? Why would you not want to use a supera there? You know, you know, I, you know, you're right. That is a flexion. And point. the vessel is very big. I think five five will be fine. There's not much of a calcification. Supera, I think, should deploy easily. No. I just worry about that distal wire. Okay. You know, if you if you look at the fracture rates, right? Uh, let's look at let's let's. And I know we hear, we hear about this a lot from everyone, including myself, about the fracture of Sapera being less, and I think it absolutely is true. But if you look at if you look at Zilber PTX, and if you look at their randomized control data, okay, and this is held true with their with their Japanese PMA as well as well as their uh, uh, their registries. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the the fracture rate, 1.8 percent at one year, at oh, two years, and, a and at three years. Oh, you don't have the wire yet. Just a little bit. 
Okay. One year, two year, and three years. Okay. So okay. therefore, nice rail, please. So, so I think that a 1.8 percent uh, uh, fracture rate is very, very low. Right. Uh, and I think that that should. I'm okay accepting that in this in this stage, especially with all these complexities that we have here. So now I'm just going to place this there. I'm going to go RAO. Just a little die by. So I got I plenty of go room here. Bit, yeah. So I'm going to go down even further. This is fine. A little bit of overlap here is not going to kill me. Uh, a little bit of die here. Profunda looks like it's disease free, so it should yeah, be I okay. Yeah, I think I think this is a good spot. Yeah, that's if a good spot. We just leave it without moving. A cell into, into the profunda should be fine. I think so. no, we leave it just like this. We should yeah. be okay. Yeah. Actually, got to yeah. go maybe a little bit in. Yeah. Just a little bit in. This is an Abbott's tent, so yeah. it'll deploy wherever you leave it. So it may come back. It comes back. Want to a little in? Yeah. <coughs> okay. Good. Yeah. Watch the die. He's got yeah. chronic yeah. Uh huh. Little die now. As he's flaring. So yeah. four, I Good. think four knobs and it starts to unsheathe. Okay. It doesn't now, move. Now Abbott's tent doesn't move, Vishal. So you can, no. you can Good. deploy where like it is. It. You can go by the black markers. I understand. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. Nice. Walk it out now. All right. Abbott said doesn't move, but PK will make me move, so you know you have to understand <laughs> that part. <laughs> it's always like, PK's fault. So love the way you filter guys moves, move. you're done, and the send moves, you're done. So I love I love the blame. I told you I have a kid to feed, right. so I need a job. And now we need to do this one. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's take a picture now. Hold on. Yes, sir. PK, we are going work abuse life, you know. I know. <laughs> Everybody knows that. <laughs> Everybody understands my plight. Ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. So we haven't posed out anything. We've got the filter in place. And you can see we've embolized again. I think it's all the filter that's no, caused that. I don't know. It's embolization, PK. I think it's still that segment in the, between the yep. two distal I think uh, yeah, steps. No, good, guys. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> so I am going to continue my, 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 my feeling that we should bare metal stent this. What size length do you think you need? Yeah, here, probably 100 is 100 good. 100 is good. 100 is good? Yeah. yeah. Do we have a 120 Everflex? Yeah, 120 would be perfect. Do we have a 6.0? 6.0, 120. Well, we have a 7.0. Oh. What do we have? PK, that's a that's a 6.0 oh stent, right? Zilver? Yep. So you you can use a 7.0, oh, right? It's a big vessel, so. We have 120s, right? Yeah, we have 120s. 120 is fine. What about 7.0s? Oh? Do you have 120? 7.0, oh, no. Hmm. PK, if you uh, why don't you use a 55-120 Supera and keep pushing the wire when you're deploying it? Yeah, I think that's what we're going to have to do here. Yeah. Give us a 55-120 Supera. <coughs> and just keep a track on the wire, you know? Deploy a couple of cells, the push the right. wire in. Deploy a couple of cells, push the wire in. Now we'll watch the wire. Yeah, it's, a, it's an embo shield, so the filter is yeah. independent of the wire, so. No, I know filter's not going to work, so <coughs> the wire to come out. We're way down with the wire, so yeah. should be okay. <coughs> What do you have, 120? You can always push the wire independent of the filter, so. That's, is that a 120? It doesn't look like a 120, guys. <coughs> but it's a Supera PK, so you can. That's not a 120, guys. You can even use a hundred. It's you a supera, so you can always five five hundred. <coughs> but the problem is, should I go? Should I go with a five or a five five here? Five five, because the proximal stent is a five five, five right? Five. The still yeah. stent is a six zero, so five five is pro. The vessel is very big, so. No, I agree. I'm just thinking about it because I'm not going to prep it. Yeah, which that's is, the biggest which thing. Which is the only worry with the supera. Yeah, you want to elongate it and then end up. And with that's my only yeah. worry. No, but your vessel is very big, right? So well, it should be yeah, okay. But the prep. Yes, five five hundred. Yep. Okay. I don't want it to take a smaller stent and have a thrombus behind the stent. So. This is uh, one well of the said. one of the difficulties that we face, right? So I think approximately we're okay with bare metal, and the other thing is, as far as follow up is concerned, I think you need to get baseline velocities on all these stents. Are you okay, sir? Baseline velocities on all these stents, and then after which, what you want to do is you want to go ahead. And, and follow these closely. Now, now, if the baseline velocities are good and the patient is doing well, then I think what you need to do is decide 
down the road as far as what, um, you know, when you're going to reintervene and how you're going to reintervene. So, so with this many stances, Reese knows the rates are going to be high. And like I said, we, we kind of dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's, spoke to our colleagues at Vascular. Um, we spoke, we, we, we knew what, what kind of our, our plan was going to be in terms of bare metal versus drug-coated therapy. Okay, so here we've decided on, on, drug, on bare metal therapy because we know that the drug's already there and we think the mechanism is not going to be quite exactly what we felt, which was, um, a thr we knew what the mechanism was, which is thrombus. So go, to go ahead and replace drug-coated therapy is probably not the bright thing to do. So we're going to go in a little forward. Yeah, I, I think. Let me see. Let me see the, let me see the above. Yeah, I think we're, yeah, well, this is going to be real tough to deploy it perfectly. That's part moving. of the problem with this stent is the deployment. Uh, give me the dry one. Or should we just go with the 150 to be safe? Yeah, or 120. This is a 120, right? I'll just go with the 120 to be safe, PK. Yeah, You're going to fall a short. Yeah, give me a one You're definitely going to fall short. At some yeah. point, you might have to compress the stent a little bit. Yep. So that way you don't have to worry about, you can always compress the stent a little bit and it should be okay. Agreed. <laughs> Part of the problem with the Supera is these kind of things, you know, if you, if you had, if you had, it's a great stent, but if you had some adequate deployment, you know, or, or comfort level with deploying it, then I think it would be wonderful if we could say, hey, I could drop it on a dime here and take care of it. But in this kind of case, you really can't drop this one on a dime. So Especially when you've not prepped the vessel. Because yeah, um, the, the ultrasounds, would you do, and Vishal, same to you, is, would you guys do 1, 6, and 12, or 1, 3, 6, and 12? And go ahead, Vishal. No, I mean, in this case, I'll probably closely monitor him because we know he, he probably has a more thrombogenic potential. So I would probably do 1, 3, 6, and 12. But okay. again, it's, uh, what's your choice, PK? I agree with Vishal there. I think, I think uh, at least after six months, I would do every, every three months pull. Uh-huh, rail. Mm -hmm. Nice rail, please. Okay. Um, so I think at least out to um, six months I would do that. And then I would worry about um, after that what else to do. Okay. PK, if you see some restenosis, would you bring him immediately like, and, and take care of it? You know, this is interesting because we had this discussion at a conference I was in recently. So, you know, that data is all, you know, the surveillance data is all extrapolated from, uh, from bypass graphs. So obviously the bypass graft, especially SVG graphs, <coughs> So we look, if you look at the SVG graphs, you obviously want to be able to give me a dry close. You obviously want, don't want that graft to go down because obviously the wound healing um, and the five-year patencies are phenomenal right. with an SVG graft. But if you, look at, if you look at what we're doing here, you know, the question is with the claudicant now, is that an issue? So I think the true answer is I don't know. Um, I, think, I think we have no data to suggest that surveillance and re-intervention reduces further ischemic events. Right. So uh, in this case, you could say, well, this guy presented with rest pain, so therefore we're, we're, we should go ahead and, and, and do this. So I don't know. The answer, truthfully, is I don't know. But would I do it? Absolutely. Just get this out here. OK, that's good. Vishal, you want to just keep pushing the wire? Yeah. Just to be well, let's, just, let's deploy a little bit and then watch. That's deploying well there. Everybody happy with the stent geometry? Yeah. I think it's well. See it. And the beads are right. <coughs> okay. I think that's fine. Yeah. Let's check the wire below. Good. Okay, very good. Came back a little bit. A little bit, but we're okay. Oh, okay. So I think I think that's the answer as far as that's concerned. This yeah. is a 120 or 150? 120. 120. I'm gonna have to pull this. Yeah. Piki, <coughs> I think you're doing a fantastic job. Just wanted to let you know. I really <coughs> appreciate that. Show me above. I really do because Vishal is very, being very critical next to me. <laughs> you know, he's telling me, you know, old man, what the hell are you doing? Get out of the way. And Elizabeth is defending me. <coughs> you want to compress it there a little bit? I think you're getting too much of an overlap of the stents. That's what I'm doing here.
Now we are, where's the end of the stent here? It's there, you just have to compress a little bit more The there. end of the stent is in the nose? Right, right there. Right there. So you're there, I, I would not compress more than that. Yeah, so I would pull back a little bit, PK, it's going to, it's going to come back, right? Regular length. Well, that's it. Go. That's perfect. All Fantastic. Right. Wow. <laughs> Again, Vishal not happy with me. <laughs> My job is to keep the wire down. That's what I did. I, I think Vishal, you did a great job. I did job. a better job than him. Yes. Uh, I think you. you did a great job. Very tough. Tough crowd. <laughs> tough crowd. Tough crowd. Okay. All right, guys. Let's let's now decide what we're going to do with this filter. Let's check our wire that it's not outside the toe that Vishal promised, and it's good. So, so now we can, you know, I believe in Ronald Reagan's uh, philosophy. Uh, you know, I was old enough uh, uh, to, to vote for Ronald Reagan. So uh, I, I can filter? tell you that the trust yeah, but verify is something I truly I'll believe in. The filter. Ready, yeah. DSA? So critical, so critical, PK. Ready? Okay, inject. And then uh, there was flow. We got it. Okay, let's get that filter out, and then and then we'll talk about the tibial. Mm. Now let's look at that other flow here. Liz, Liz, did, did you know I voted for Ronald Reagan? I yeah. still see a lot of uh, collaterals coming in, PK. Somewhere mm. there is a still we have some uh, slow flow. Look at the proximal segment. Here it looks nice. I think we're okay, Karthik. I'm not too worried. I'll look at the proximal segment, and then I'm going to capture the filter. Yeah. I still still see some profunda coming before the SFA. Oh, there's no question. I think the filter is being obstructive here. Yeah. Inject. That's better. I think time time to retrieve the filter. Yeah, yeah. I think time to retrieve the filter, and then and then deal with the distal. Uh, would you version. retrieve it with a? Uh, uh, would you retrieve it? Okay. Yeah. Th that's yeah. what so I was going to go ask. in with penumbra. Because you already have it on the table, so. Yeah. Give me the bowl. Let me. I already, I already cleaned it. Okay. PK, would you give a lot of uh, uh, nitro, verapamil, vasodilators? I'm going to as soon as I retrieve it. Okay. Okay. I would. I would go. So <coughs> the question is whether we do do DS of the proximal <coughs> proximal uh, tibial now. If you do the DS of the proximal tibial, don't you think you are uh, yeah. AT? If you want to come back for the AT, it might be a little difficult for you. Well, let's see. I mean, let's see how this flow is, and then we decide. We have the IVIS in place. I think so the peroneal from the pictures looked fine, no, PK? I, didn't I, feel, feel, I feel the same. Yeah, I it was just same. diffuse disease, but I think it looked okay. Now, now the problem is, will the penumbra get down there, let's say, with all these stents? So let's see. Ready, Flora? One second. Got it? You know, show me above now. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem, guys, when you do the penumbra, you really want to watch it through all the stents. And you want to you wanna just be careful. You don't want any stent compression anywhere. Right. Or any, or any or deformation. Of the stand, yeah. yeah, deformation of the stents. Right, so. Nope. Another thing that I've done, uh, Rishal and I have done, is put, uh, put an 035 wire through this. Side by yeah. side. So give us an 035 super core, please. So we're going to just put side by side to 035 wire. You think the 035 will go through it? Yeah. Sure, it should. Go. With the 2E? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm just going to shove it down. Here. Yeah. Just going to so it's going to wire all the way down to the next tent. Okay, good. Show me above now. Mm -hmm. So now, now you kind of make it like a single, really? single operator show here, and just kind of just take it down. So here it's obviously stuck in the, the stent strut. So I'm going to pull, pull it back out, and then see how it went. Yeah, so, so that's a great thing. technique. So then we're going to show it down now. Just make sure the O3 fire wire is held. Yep. Um, <sighs> real? Yeah, it is real. Oh, it's stuck again. So these open cell stents really cause issues when you don't post dilate them. So here I'm going to just try to rotate this away from that strut, and it's not. So the wire is biasing. 
So a lot of times here, what you have to do is pull the wire back to the soft portion. Pull the wire back to the soft portion, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Then and then try to redirect now. Uh, pull back even further. Right there. No, nope, you got to take the wire completely back into the guide here. And then see whether we can redirect away. And nope. There you go. There you go. Now maybe put the wire back. Now put the wire back in yeah. and see. It's just biased towards that left. Or patient's right. There you there. go. Wire back. Just leave the soft part of the wire in front. And just walk it through with the wire, right? Yeah. A little more. That's enough. Let's see now. Uh-huh. Okay. okay. Advance the wire slightly. That's good. Show me now. Okay. Should go through the superior push. without a problem. Push the wire. Mm -hmm. okay. One second. Okay. Push the wire. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, we're there now. Wire up. Actually, you know what? Let's get it into the distance. Yeah, just app. make sure it yeah. wire out now. All right, now we're going to take the wire out. Not yet. So these are some of the, the what I call as pain in the ass, pain in the, excuse me, butt techniques uh, that we have to deal with, you know, but it's a reality in our, in our business. Nothing, sorry, sir, nothing is made perfectly well for our, uh, for our devices, so we have to deal. Turn it on, guys. Turn it on. So now I'm going to go down, try to capture the, 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 the stent, there's the embo shield, right? Hopefully it comes in and it's not, so I'm going to have to pull the wire, okay? The wire came back. And now I'm going to try to tr advance the wire floor, please. Yeah. Slowly, that's fine. The wire is distal, that's all I care. And I'm just going to let it just follow this back now. Mm -hmm. Actually, show me above. Yeah, we shall just walk it out. Just don't advance the wire. Yeah. Yep, just try not to. So we're just walking this out. And what we're going to do is there's no flow, much flow in the, in the, in the uh, embo shell right now. Or in the, uh, show the flow in the uh, canister, please. Oh, you are showing it. Yep. Yeah. You can see the flow is very poor. That's because the embo shield is trapped. Yep. Right? So now, now the important thing before you inject is check that the embo shield is in, still inside the guide. If it's not inside the guide, then the problem is that you probably left it inside the sheath. Right. Second thing you can check is the pressure. See what the pressure is. So the pressure looks good, so there's nothing uh, obstructive in the sheath. And finally, now you want to flush it out to make sure it's there. And sometimes it takes a couple of flushes for it to come out. Yep. Right and there's there. the embo shield. And any thrombus? Yeah, there is a yep. there's thrombus right there. There's some thrombus. And then, of course, I and then, uh, off. And then, um, um, we're going to go ahead and flush the sheath again. Hold on. Yep, there's a lot of layered thrombus. Yeah. Yep. A lot of and again, that may be the one that's causing the issue for, yeah. for the flow, but yeah. we'll see. And again, then, you, you know, who knows how much of nice it, gloves. Who knows how much of it was actually, uh, you know, sucked out as we were coming up. Okay. I just want Let's to let uh, uh, and I just want to make it clear, PK. I think you, uh, only PK gets to talk like that during the live. Case. What happened? What did I do? I said, you know. All right. FCC, FCC violation. I guess. Oh, my God. So I, I said I, only PK gets to talk like lots that. Lots of nitride, guys. Yeah. Would, you put the cather, would you put a catheter down and give actually, nitride or just give it from above? Actually, you know, if you think about it, it's, it's really an anatomic part that I was describing. It's a nitride, right? Yes, that's true. And it also could be the name of a, uh, what is it, a male or a female donkey? <coughs> Almost there. That's it. Just some. Picture. I think we are going af off path here. So okay. <laughs> Why don't we stay on the path? And me and Vishal want to keep our so job. So one of the so things that a lot of the viewers have told me in conferences, and they said that that uh, you guys are very ent entertaining, and I'm very boring. They said that I need to spruce it up a little bit. Oh. Keep, so keep, keep up with the youngsters. So they want they wanted you to show the New York side. All right. Yes. Got it. That's all. Flushing. Flushing. Yeah. So now we're gonna. Hopefully, we'll be done. 
Let's see how we were flushing a lot of nitride in. How much did you give Vishal your? 200 on nitride. 200. And he has enough blood pressure room. I think PK, we have demonstrated a very difficult case. Uh, I think we have demonstrated all the aspects of the difficult case, what to expect and everything. I think you, you guys did a great job. One picture, we'll see. Hold on, one second, let me give a little bit more. He's going to give a little bit more nitride. 450. Yep. Total 100, right? Good. Perfect. So we're giving about 150 of nitride. Mm -hmm. Good. Hopefully this will be our final shots. We're 10 minutes over our duration. I think you have the flow. You have the flow, you have the yeah. flow. You can take yeah, pictures. Hold on. Let it fill in. up here. So again, always start distal to proximal, right? I mean. And there the flow. Beautiful. I mean, that vessel does not look healthy, so we might have to talk about this in terms so of. So if, if you pull the wire back, we can take a oh, picture. That's you exactly think? what I'm doing, but I still don't think that's going to look healthy uh, or, or give us the confidence that we need to to say yeah, we no. can leave it alone. Magnify and yeah. then, uh, yeah. You think take a more angled picture would open that up well, uh, we are, through we the are, bone? We, we yeah. were angled. We'll do a little more angle. Okay, there you go. See that? Yeah. I think that, that should be settled. Still. I think at this stage, with all this hard work we did, you could say let's put him on Zeralto and see how he does, but. I mean, are you going to regret not doing that? And I think the true answer is I don't know. You know? Would you stent it or just? Uh, I, I mean, at this stage, I, I wouldn't want to take a chance. Uh -huh. I mean, I'd much rather just secure it. Uh, but we'll see. Let's see how all this looks now. So that's without post dilatation, guys. No post dilatation. Right, that's Zero. that's really good, and I think it's okay yeah. not to postulate this. I think if you want to bring him back, if the velocities go up or, or later on and touch it up, that's really <coughs> up to you, like in that one spot. But I think at this stage, I'm not going to do any. Post because why I'm saying DES is why I'm saying questioning DES is uh, you st he still has an option of fem pop, right? Yeah, yeah. At some point, mm -hmm. right. yeah. give me a 6015 via track. I'm just going to balloon that top spot. Doesn't look like much thrombus there. Okay. Give me a 6015 via track. It's already excluded by the stent. You shouldn't have much. PK. But so what I'm saying is, uh, Vishal, you too. I mean, I'm, what I'm saying no DES in TB also is, he still has an option of fem pop, right? Liz, his, uh, pop, his pop so is not track. stented. Yeah, that's my, my just thing is leaving that zone just the in case it fails right again. And yeah, he can for still go for a fem pop, right? I know you guys said there's no yeah. veins. He doesn't have veins, but you can always take an arm vein, right? We can always do it, but the question is, I mean, uh, I'm just trying to think. I mean, maybe we should we even balloon this, just leave this, because it's right at the area. If you can show the two screens, guys, this looks to be right at the area that, that dissection slash clot, right? right? I mean, uh, you know, we don't have a filter down. But that, that stent looks terrible right there, though. I mean, to me, I don't want it to thrombose, because the stent is not This well looks like the area where they had the most recoil in the first pictures when yeah. you guys took. That's right. where most of the right. recoil it's was. On the reference side on the right. right. I think we, we've done a good job of thrombectomy. I don't see any real thrombus there. So I think I'm just going to balloon it. What do you think? Yeah, so I think so. We can I think you can balloon it, balloon. Short balloon. Yeah. And then we're not going to stent the distal. Okay. So we decided. No, yeah. So we're going to use the 014 balloon, a 6015 Viatrack, which is an Abbott balloon, which is really a renal balloon here. And I think what we'll do is give me more nitride, guys. Okay, I'm observing that uh, giving a lot of outflow with the tibial vessels, Actually gives a higher state patency. I don't. I don't think there's a data on it, but well, that's, I, I, that's my personal observation over time. It makes a lot of logical sense, and I think in these kind of cases, you, you really have to give a lot of thought to it. You know, and the only reason I'm ballooning this is because I'm really unhappy with the way that's kind of infolded on itself. Right. And yeah. I think this is over the monorail balloon. Um, so I think this way it'll 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 help us a lot. Put me on coronary, Siraj. I forgot to introduce Siraj and Farhan. Siraj is our, is our interventional fellow, really one of the best we've ever had. 
and 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 Farhan is uh, well. Is just uh, we'll an we'll uh, everybody email me, please. <laughs> Thank you. I think Farhan is one of the best endovascular fellows we had. So let me put it that way. There we go. Ready? Let's go up here. I see a smile on PK and Vishal's face. I don't know why you guys are smiling. You, know? you guys are trying to contradict me. You can contradict me. Uh, oh, uh, you know. Never. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, down. Now I hope I'm not going to live to regret this. Uh, go up to ten now. Go up to ten, fifteen, even. Right there. 10, 15, 15. That looks more like a recoiled area, PK. That yeah, doesn't look like yeah. a. Yeah. The only problem is you never know if you have layered uh, thrombus that you're going to embolize now, which I pray we don't. But again, sometimes enemy of good is better, and I didn't listen to myself. Let's see. That's a that's a little bit better expansion, and I hopefully it's not going to cost me much. I don't remember the wires in a twig distally. Actually, it's in a stent, so don't worry. It's about in the stent, it. so it's okay. You can pull the wire back. Yeah. Okay. So. All right, now let's go low mag here. Give me, actually, let's give some night pride and all that stuff, and then we should be done. How are we here, bro? So, um, any any other thoughts, uh, Karthik and, or, or Vishal, in terms of? No, I think follow up is more important for these people than uh, I think. You know, of, of course, you know, doing do, you guys did a great job, but the follow up I think is the key for him. Uh, we have to get him at the first sign of his uh, restenosis or first sign of claudication. So. And I, I think in this case, IBIS especially helped us really define. Remember, we started with the argument about what's going on. Is it the inflow? Is it the outflow? Is it the dissection between the stand, before the stand, the proximal segment, which is the DES? So this is, I guess, one of those few cases where IBIS would really help us define what's going on, right. give us so-called an insight, really. And then that way we can make an educated decision whether did my DCB fail from last time because of the proximal segment, or is it what just the mid-segment we just have to stand? So I think it really helped us at least make a decision in the favor, so that hopefully reducing the chances of failure uh, down that the line. That looks lane. great. No, I'm going to leave that. That's much better. Yeah. Now I'm just going to look distally. Uh, hopefully, our final shots here. That was great. That's phenomenal. That's great. Now the foot. I, mean, I think I understand it's tempting to do something to that vessel, but I guess we just leave it, follow him in clinically, get the ultrasounds. And plus, you know, I think, I think like you said, you know, it, it, that we're going to change his anticoagulation regimen. Right. We're going to send him to Hemonc uh, to see. You can wow. see the anterior tubular lights right back up. Beautiful. And we can always get distal AT access. Yeah, and, uh, or, or proximal. Yeah, I, I would definitely open that AT. It looks like a short segment CTO. There we go. There's not much calcification. It might be not a bad idea to just open that AD from the tibial axis. Totally agreed. So I think what we will do is we will look at that. Beautiful. Now. Look at that. Yeah, it's a it's a great AT Huge. to open up. It's. So I think I think now I think I think you know we're gonna let uh, uh, what you called uh, uh, Farhan uh, remove everything here. We're uh, hemostasis wise, Farhan. What do you think we're gonna do for closure here? Uh, um, uh, manual, I think. Manual. Yeah. Manual, you think? Okay. So we're going to do a little manual, we're going to do a manual closure, and I'm just going to make sure our common femoral doesn't have a thrombus or anything layered on it. Okay, good. All right. I think, I, I think nice I think, job. I, I think overall, I think, Karthik, I think just in, in summary, I think Vishal, me and you, I think we did a phenomenal job on, on how to handle this. And I think the salient points when you're dealing with the ISR and thrombus in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a brief and summarized manner are, are the following. One, what's the clinical syndrome, right? Uh, if the clinical syndrome is there, then, then, then two, you know, if you're suspecting it, I think you need to see how the wire travels. The wire travels freely through the stent or has pockets of resistance followed by free travel. Then you know you're dealing with some level of thrombus. So then, like Vishal clearly said, you need to assess the thrombus burden. If the thrombus burden is, is, is heavy, then you need to in your experience, consider between uh, thrombolytics via indwelling catheter versus, um, um, you know, androjet with uh, power pulse spray. You need to follow this patient very, very closely in a unit monitored setting. 
So like Michelle went over fibrinogen levels, yep. obviously look, exam, clinical examination, looking for early signs of uh, um, you know, um, compartment syndrome, um, and three, also make sure he doesn't bleed, control his hypertension, ETC, electrolytes, so on, and, and a hemoglobin and a hematocrit. Finally, once you're done with that, you need to bring the patient back. You need to bring the patient back and make sure that you do a check angle like we did last night to see where we are. Once we're done, like for instance, if this wasn't going to be a live case, last night the intervention, Vishal would have finished the intervention. So last night we would have done everything that we did. But if you think about the thought process of what we did, we were very, very careful. One, we first did distal protection. We had single vessel runoff. We did good diagnostics, inflow, outflow put a distal protection device. We chose a distal protection device that's not gonna move despite the use of heavy equipment. So we chose the EmboShield. It's off-label for this use. Um, all three of us have written a paper that's in Jack Interventions that talks about the algorithm for use of distal embolization uh, for, for distal protection. And one of, the, one of the algorithms that indicates that you should use it is the, is the presence of a thrombotic lesion. So that's already peer reviewed and published in a, in a, very, in a major journal. After that, we decided to do AngioJet. We did angiojet because we felt angiographically there was still layered thrombus. Did angiojet up and down, we filled the filter. Then we did a suction thrombectomy to alleviate the filter. After we did that, we went ahead and did a, a intravascular ultrasound which showed us pro the possible mechanism of failure. And very, very clearly, it was the proximal edge of the, of the first stent, with, uh, head, uh, edge of the supera, which had a dissection, which seemed to be two lumens and definitely uh, probably caused the, the, the closure by falling into the false lumen, thereby closing off the supera. So, so then the decision was made to treat with stenting. So the choice of stent we discussed was bare metal versus DCB. So if the mechanism of failure was dissection and thrombus, uh, then we felt there was no reason to use a drug-coated balloon. So we decided to go with a bare metal stent um, without post-dilatation. We had intravascular ultrasound, and we went ahead and chose to size the stent properly, supera, uh, Abbott, and, uh, and the EV3 stent. Once we did that, we did, we did not post dilate because we were afraid of embolizing distally. Once, uh, copious amounts of nipride to show the runoff, evaluation of the filter, capture the filter under the proper technique with the use of the penumbra. After which, what we decided to do was, was go ahead and evaluate <clears throat> the distal vessel. Perineal vessel, there was no critical stenosis. Moderate stenosis was present. So therefore, the consensus here was to, was to leave that um, alone. Now we took completion angiography, it was phenomenal. We post dilated, which is questionable, honestly, in this case, uh, a, a, a focal area of the, uh, of the uh, Everflex, uh, protege Everflex stent. After which, now we talked about anticoagulation and follow up. In this case, the patient failed aspirin plavix, so we're going to switch him to Berlinta and, and, and we're going to switch him to uh, um, a, uh, a thrombotic agent such as a Xeralto if there's no contraindication. Two, he needs to see workup. So, so we don't have an arc definition of thrombosis. We, we, don't, we haven't checked him for platelet uh, plavix resistance. But we felt he failed dual antiplatelet therapy. We have to give him a newer agent. So we're going to do that. Again, off-label. Unfortunately, we don't have the data to support what we do. Uh, Euclid didn't work out in terms of cardiovascular events. So therefore, we, we, we went ahead and we're going to switch him to this just to see uh, whether this is going to help. Three, we're going to set him to hematology. Maybe he has a clotting disorder that needs to be addressed. So, so hematology will, will, will help us and assist us with that, probably as an outpatient, since he's already gotten inpatient thrombolytics and may throw off their panel. Finally, as far as surveillance is concerned, one, very quick uh, uh, follow-up at one month, uh, maybe even sooner, two weeks, one month, followed by ultrasounds at one, three, six, and nine, and then maybe 12. I think this is to look for, for resnosis or any change in symptoms. Do we have data to suggest that, that, that we should do these ultrasounds uh, clearly? We discussed during the case that the, this data is really extrapolated from the vein, vein graph surveillance, and there's really no, no morbidity or, 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 or endpoint data associated with, uh, with uh, addressing instant restenosis, which is asymptomatic. Uh, and so therefore, I think this is more for our own knowledge, knowing that this can become a real problem if this thrombosis again. So I think there's a very, very complicated case that we did in about an hour and 15 minutes. I would say an hour of procedural time because the first 30 minutes we discussed the angiogram. 
So about an hour's time, we were able to get this done. I think it really illustrates if you really spend some time thinking about how to approach these patients, really be systematic in your approach, anticipate the complications that you know is going to occur, uh, and we predicted every single one, and we were able to handle every single one, Vishal and I and Karthik. So I think that, that you guys uh, out there, you know, if you, if you apply this to these types of cases, I think you'll be very, very successful. Again, on behalf of Vishal Kapoor, Karthik Gujar, and myself, and the entire team at Sinai, we invite you wholeheartedly to really come and, and join us here at uh, Link Mount Sinai and the 20th anniversary of the CCVVC conference. Dr. Sharma's conference has really been phenomenal for the last 20 years, educating well, people from not only in this area, but all over the world. And, we re and I personally hope to really follow in that footsteps along with Karthik and Vishal to really educate in the endovascular space. The other thing also is, is to really invite you because we have a collaboration with really a world-renowned uh, uh, group uh, with, with, with Dirk Scheinert and, and, and the good folks at Link. Um, and also, we are also incorporating aortic work with, with Dr. J James McKinsey, Michael Marin, Peter Ferries, and, and Dr. Torcello, who is really out of Munster, one of, the, one of the leaders in Europe at doing aortic work. So this concomitant session along with CCVVC, uh, a two-day uh, session, Link, Link Mount Sinai, is really going to be phenomenal in terms of the global education of, of endovascular and vascular medicine. So we're going to have two rooms. The first room is going to be in the Stern Auditorium, which is going to encompass cases such as this, uh, really covering all aspects of, of uh, endovascular intervention, whether it's carotid, whether it's renal, whether it's, uh, you know, for obesity. Vivek Reddy is talking about one of the cutting-edge technologies on obesity, as well as tough cases of virus are transmitted from both uh, Link, uh, Germany, Leipzig, Germany, as well as Mount Sinai here in New York. Then concomitantly in the aortic room, Dr. James McKinsey and Dr. Torcello are going to lead the aortic session. And you can see there, you're going to see multiple live cases performed from, uh, from Munster, Germany, as well as Mount Sinai here with Dr. McKinsey. And then the prelude to that on the 12th is going to be our, our fellows course led by both, both Dr. Guja and Dr. Kapoor, who have done an incredibly a hard job of putting together that agenda and getting the appropriate faculty, as well as more importantly, getting, get, getting all the fellows here. So, you know, I, I can't invite you and uh, more graciously or really really ask you to come because I think that this is going to be an event that's going to that's going to stick out in your mind in the academic calendar of your conference calendar so again I, I look forward to you I thank Dr. Guja I thank our entire team Vishal thank you very much and we will see you in uh, in uh, in the CCBBC and Link Mount Sinai thanks again Karthik fantastic excellent job PK and Vishal uh, I think that uh, Dr. Dr. Krishnan and Dr. Kapoor demonstrated uh, an excellent uh, very difficult case of subacute SFA occlusion, as uh, PK just spoke about, uh, summarized it very well. So we look forward uh, to seeing you again for the symposium, and we are excited to have you here. I think uh, you'll have a lot of fun and uh, learn a lot of new things. Uh, looking forward to you again. Uh, see you next time. Have a great day.